This is ADT 1160U, Digital Communication Technologies. The title of this video clip is Interview with Stephen Downs. The analysis questions for this video clip are the interview questions. What are the most important cognitive skills in this information overload society? For people who are used to social media, information overload can be challenging. What would you suggest to someone who is just getting into this information overload? How do you foresee the future of schools, businesses, and government in the Web 2.0 society? I guess the most direct question I have to ask you is, um, what are the most important cognitive skills in this information overload society? Uh, selection. <laughs> uh, certainly that's an important one. It's, it's always, always has been important historically. It's just we see that more and more uh, today. I mean, just being able to pick out of a complex information environment what uh, what data is relevant, important, and salient at the moment. That's probably a key. Um, and then drawing inferences from that. Uh, so I guess the second skill would be pattern recognition. Uh, I think that's crucial. It's uh, To me, pattern recognition and, and similarity generally is the basis for inference. Uh, it's the basis not only for uh, inductive reasoning where we would expect it, but I think it's also the basis for even the formal types of inference. And then a lot of the, the sorts of inference we don't even give the name inference to, uh, but what we would call intuitive uh, or even empathetic uh, responses, I think are, are both cases of pattern recognition. And I guess as an aside question to these two skills, um, how, how can we prepare students for that? Or how should I prepare myself to face that world? Practice. <laughs> really, I, that's the only way to do it. Uh, practice and reflection. Uh, it's part of my super simple learning theory. Uh, to teach is to model and demonstrate, to learn is to practice and reflect. Uh, it's really too simple to be called a theory and it's probably not mine anyways but in you know I mean you think you know just in, from the perspective of those two skills right selection and pattern recognition which, which are really actually two sides of the same skill now that I think of it uh, it really is just a matter of, of doing it and honing your abilities at it uh, you know think think of things like wine tasters right uh, they start off, they can barely distinguish wine from beer, uh, but by the end of their training, you know, they, they can distinguish which plant the grapes grew on. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, you know, similarly, people's sense of color with aesthetics. Uh, some people can distinguish between 89 shades of white. Me, I have white and non-white, uh, and that's pretty much it. I, I could go on with examples like that, but... What happens in all of these cases, you know, I mean, medical diagnosis, landing aircraft, uh, advanced mathematics, what happens in all of these cases is you begin with a very coarse and unrefined perception of the phenomenon you're dealing with, uh, but through practice, you know, and, and, and not just doing the same thing over again, but, but practice, feedback, reflection, response, through practice, you develop this more fine-grained, fine-tuned uh, sense of pattern recognition, and that makes you much more able to adapt and respond to circumstances. Right. So, in other words, don't wait. Start now. It's messy. You won't be comfortable. Get out yeah. there and do it. Yeah. You also asked, you know, about preparing students for that, and that's the modeling and demonstrating part of it, and. You know, I, I really think you have to show, uh, you know, not just the final answers, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a nice Sherlock Holmes sort of thing where, ah, she's obviously the guilty person, but, but to actually show the reasoning, show uh, what you did in order to come to the conclusions, and because it gives people a hook, you know, a model to emulate, uh, and, and, that's what, and that's how they'll start, you know, practicing it, because... They don't have any example. They have nowhere to start. You know, they're, they're, right. they're 
the practice and the reflection will eventually actually take them beyond the model, but they need some place to start. And that's why modeling and demonstrating is so important. So you would you would figure that you would suggest that as 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 a professor as a teacher a person should get in the mess of things and yeah. show that the process is difficult. You're not yeah. controlling the subject. You're not the god of knowledge. Yeah. And when you are there, students will see you scratching yeah. your head and thinking, "Oh, I've got this missing," or maybe maybe the yeah. information is incomplete, but I know this guy who can provide me with some. And allowing exactly. that humility. I, I used to teach logic, and the most effective part of my logic classes would be the reading of the daily newspaper, where I'd go to the letters of the editor section, which is always the best stuff's always there, and and pick out letters and analyze them, right? And you know they're not pre-made, you know, carefully crafted examples. The writing is loose and sloppy and messy and. Uh, you know, you have to go through this process. What could this person possibly be trying to say? You know, and then, you know, once you get what they're after, figuring out what's wrong with it, because there's almost always something wrong with it. Uh, and, and that was, you know, that's the sort of process that, you know, students can say, oh, yeah, I get this. It's not like there is a right answer, although there sometimes is. Um, you know, it's this thing you go through. It's, it's not this final neat package that I'm after. It's this process of understanding these pieces of writing. Right. So the process rather than the product. Yeah. Insisting on that kind of pedagogy where there's, yeah. uh, there's something happening and not just a product being delivered. Yeah. And that's why I say when I talk about MOOCs, for example, uh, you know, that's why I say the content isn't important. You know, we're not trying to get people to memorize content. That's not the whole point of a MOOC at all. Um, in a MOOC, what I'm doing as a MOOC facilitator is I'm modeling my practice. You know, here I am, I'm going to do an inquiry over eight weeks into such and such a subject, and I'm opening up my computer, my desktop, my audio feeds, my office, for people to come along and, and think about these things as I think about them. And if you get something out of that, that's great. You know, but you're not supposed to remember all this stuff. That's absurd. There's way too much to remember. And even if you could remember it, it's irrelevant. What's important is the process. You know, being able to, to think, in this case, being able to think like an educational designer or an instructional designer. Or when I teach philosophy, being able to keep being able to think like a philosopher. Right. So developing a, a way of thinking uh, yeah. by doing. Yeah. All right, so that that's that's a good uh, that's a good illustration. Now, how do you learn to program? Well, the first thing you do is program "Hello World." If you can get a computer to say "Hello World," everything else follows. Um, you know, how how do you get into online content? Well, start a blog. Something simple. How do you start a blog? Well, find someone who's started the blog and do what they did. You know, and it's it's always. Get started, start doing, get that interaction going, get feedback, get response. And, you know, there isn't, you know, a nice neat course of ABCD. Just, you know, the discipline changes, the people change, uh, and there's no one way to do it. Right. Totally agree with that. Now, totally agree, but difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Because it's especially from the perspective of, uh, you know, someone who's been doing it for a while, I was going to say expert, but I want to avoid that kind of terminology, but especially from the perspective of someone who's been doing it for a while, someone who's in the role of the instructor, the temptation really is to just say, well, do this, just do this, and, and you'll be set, but, uh, you know, because you have a right answer, but, uh, but, but, you know, that's not really, I mean, that's telling them the answer, but it's not really uh, helping them learn. Right. So, given all of this, how do you foresee the future of schools and businesses and government in the Web 2.0 society? Does that sort of, you just talked about a change of power and, and, and a change of ways of being for a teacher and a learner, but do you think mm -hmm. that there are higher structures that will have to change with this? I'd like to think they'll change. Uh, they might not, uh, you know. I mean, we we kept kings long after we discovered they weren't useful. 
we kept them for centuries after discovering they weren't useful. Um, so, you know, the, the structures of government, business, industry, schools might not change. You know, people like John Husband and Harold Jarkey write quite a bit uh, about how hierarchical organizations need to reorganize into more network-centric organizations. And, and some companies are attempting to do this. Louis uh, Soares writes a lot about IBM. He worked for IBM and, right. and talks about how they're becoming a decentralized network-based organization. Uh, there's quite a bit about uh, changing structures, even in the military. What's his name? Who wrote uh, Flat Army? I've forgotten his name off the top of my head. Uh, but he, he talks about that. Uh, the people who created uh, Company Command, uh, which is a peer-to-peer -peer communications network for company commanders in the military so they don't have to go through the chain of command to communicate with each other. You know, they're, again, talking about this kind of direct peer-to-peer -peer network type of organization. We've always known that this exists in practice, and uh, people like uh, Valdis Krebs like to do organizational analysis uh, actually mapping out the relationships between people. And we've always known there's kind of an informal power structure sort of along network lines in these organizations. But, uh, you know, right now, as you know, I'm sure when push comes to shove, the people at the top carry the day and, and uh, you know, can, can sweep away these network structures pretty much at will. But, but I do think that insofar as a network organization is more efficient and more effective, and I do believe they are, I think there's plenty of evidence that they are, uh, they will over time replace the, the more structured and hierarchical types of organization. Uh, but uh, it's not going to be a smooth, easy, or a quick process, and, and these things never are. Right. I think it was about 15 years ago when uh Brown and DeGid were writing The Social Life of Information. I read somewhere in one of the chapters, you know, if only HP knew what HP knows. And yeah. I, you know. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome. The synthesis questions for this video clip are as follows. What is the main lesson that Stephen Downs is trying to teach us? What are the challenges with his ideas? What concrete action can someone take to get started?